If you have a Bible, do me a favor, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 28. That's where we're going to be today, 1 Samuel 28. Uh, while, while you're turning there, uh, I want to just set this up the right way. So, how many of you ever watched, like, how many of you ever watched a movie that ended not happy? You ever seen, like, a movie just, like, ends really bleak, and you're like, oh, why did I do this to myself? Do you know what I'm talking about? One of those. Um, well, here's the thing to know about the end of 1 Samuel. We've been going through this book for a while, and today we're finishing the book. 1 Samuel ends on a very bleak note. And the reason that it does is because it wasn't originally the end of the story. Our books, 1 and 2 Samuel, were originally one book. And then for, like, length and scroll sake, they split it in half. And so you're like, man, it just seems like the story is ending rather abruptly. Yes, it is, because it's not intended to end there. But for us, it's ending here, because we got stuff to do. So, so, um, uh, so all that to say, the other thing I just want to sort of put on your radar uh, as we dig into this story today is that we're going to talk about some subject matter that is weird to Americans, but not weird to the Bible, and not weird to Christians historically. So we're going to talk about some stuff that, like, like spiritually speaking, is just off. It's going to make some of us uncomfortable. It's going to make things like, well, things that maybe we've taken for granted. We're going to be like, oh, maybe we shouldn't. And, and it's, it's just, it's odd if you're an American, but not with a biblical worldview. I just want to put that on your radar. So all that said, here's where we are. So we've been going through this book for a while now. First Samuel is a story that is all about God's uh, hand of bringing up the right leaders in the ancient nation of Israel. It takes place roughly around 1,000 uh, B.C., it's about a 1,000 years before Christ, and the story begins with God ousting some corrupt priests. There are guys, they're called the sons of Eli, and what they've been doing is they've been, they've been using their position as priests to take advantage of people, and God has a real problem with that. And so what he does is he opens the book with some Old Testament smiting. He, he opens it with like, hey, we're not going to tolerate this anymore, and he kills these guys. Like straight up, they die. And in their place, he raises this young boy, named Samuel, who's a prophet. Like, he, God speaks directly to Samuel. And he tells him, like, do this, don't do that. And, like, and, and, he, and he makes him what's called a judge, which is sort of this tribal leader in the ancient nation of Israel. He's not a king, but basically he directs and, and, and helps guide them in, in their affairs. And Samuel does this his entire life. He leads the nation of Israel as this, as this pure in heart prophet. And, and when he becomes an old man, the people come to him and they say, listen, uh, that was great, but how about you give us a king because all the other nations around us have kings, and we think we'd do really well if we had a king. And Samuel goes, that's a terrible idea, but God says, give it to them. And so he goes, okay. And so Samuel steps back, and God raises up this guy named Saul, who is the first king of Israel. And worldly speaking, Saul has it going on. Worldly speaking, Saul has it all together. He's, he's rich, he's big, he, you know, he's handsome, like he, he looks like what you would want a king to be. But the problem is this, while Saul looks good on the outside, his character does not match his gifting. And so while Saul looks good, he doesn't trust God worth a lick. And at every opportunity to trust God, he chooses to publicly disobey and do things Saul's way. He chooses to make it about Saul and Saul's name. And God goes, listen, if you're not going to honor me before people, I'm not going to honor you as king. And so God rejects Saul as king. And then decides, hey, listen, I'm going to bring from obscurity this little shepherd boy named David to be the next king. Because David loves God. It's all about God. So God raises David to prominence, right? And things go well for a little bit until Saul becomes really jealous of David and makes it his mission to kill David and destroy David's life. And last week, we talked about David's forgiveness of Saul. We talked about how David chose, okay, I will not lay a hand on Saul. If, if anything's going to happen to him, it's going to have to be God. If anybody's going to remove Saul from the throne, it's not going to be me because God put him there. God can take him down. Well, today is the day where, where God takes him down. So here's what's happened, okay? Now, as we are reaching the bleak end of the story, we find that the ancient nation of Israel is under attack from this group called the Philistines. They're kind of the, the, the bad guys throughout all of 1 Samuel, uh, or most of it. And uh, this is what our story says in 1 Samuel chapter 20, starting in verse 3. It says, now, and just sense like the sort of coldness of it, now, Samuel had died. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel. And they encamped at Gilboa. 
Verse five, when Saul saw the army of Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Verse six, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim, and we'll explain that in a minute, or by prophets. So here's where we are, okay? Things are really dire for Saul. Samuel, the prophet, is gone. Like, the, the Philistines are attacking. Saul knows this could be the end of me. And so what he wants is he wants direction from God. God, what do I do? How do I lead these people? How do we win the battle? Because up until now, even though God and Saul have stopped talking, Saul still uses God because God, like, God will indulge him a little bit because God cares about his people as a whole who Saul is leading. So he'll let Saul have a little bit of success and a little bit of victory to keep the people alive. But now the battle is going bad. And now it looks like Saul might actually be killed and Israel might be defeated. So what Saul wants to do is get a word from God. Problem is God has hung up the phone. And so if, you know, if he's not having any dreams where God might speak. There are no prophets who are talking to me like, here's what, what the Lord says. None of it. It's completely quiet. This thing here where it says, like, he's not speaking to him by Urim. Um, this is, this is it, it's a little thing you find. Uh, basically, Urim was a special kind of stone. It would be, it would be Urim and, and it was a thing called Thunim. I know it's a weird sound. Thumb him. And there were these little rocks that would, that would be in the, the breastplate of the high priest. They would take them off. It's almost like, like flipping a coin divinely. All right, and you mix it with, with sort of casting lots, which is like drawing straws. And this is how they just sort of discern like, like what God is, is doing. It was a divine appointed thing. But now, like, no matter what they're flipping, nothing's happening. Like, it's just not clear what God wants. And so Saul's looking at all this, and he's like, I've got to get somebody to tell me what God's going to do. On top of that, Saul when he was walking with God, did the right thing, as we're going to see. He got rid of all kinds of spiritual voices that weren't the Lord, okay? So when it comes to, like, mediums or, or psychics or, or diviners or what have you, people like who basically, like, they, you, you give them a buck and they say, all right, yeah, I'll tell you what the supernatural says. Saul's putting them all out of the land, which was the right thing to do. But now that means it's completely quiet on the Western Front. He has no idea what to do. And so now he's desperate. And, it, and he goes, well, if I can't turn to God, I've got to turn somewhere else. And so it says this in verse seven. Then Samuel, or so then Saul said to his servants, seek out for me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And, he, and his servant said to him, behold, there's a medium at Endor. Now Endor, not to be confused with the planet in Star Wars Return of the Jedi, which has, which has the forest moon where the Ewoks live. Different Endor, Okay. But here's the idea, okay, Saul has put the mediums out. He's gotten rid of these people who consult the dead. And the reason that he has, again, is God, like, he's, he's observing Old Testament commands from the, or for the ancient nation of Israel by God. Particularly, there's, there's one found in Deuteronomy 18. I just want to put this on your radar, okay? So here's what, here's what God says, like, when it talks about, like, this idea of consulting the dead or psychics or, or fortune tellers or what have you, this is what, like, God actually has spoken about that. In Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 10, it says, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. And we would all agree, good. <laughs> right? Go, go back, though, really quick, go back. All right, so Anybody who, who burns his son or daughter as an offering. And could we acknowledge that if God is bringing up something, that's a pretty big thing to bring up, right? Like that we would look at this and be like, man, that, that's a really big deal that somebody would do something like that, right? You know the very next thing that he says also shouldn't be found there linked with that type of severity? Look at this. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. Why? Verse 12. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. In other words, this stuff is right on par with burning your kids alive. We're talking about the spiritual severity of it. We're talking about like how big a deal this is. God goes, this is a, that's, that's, that's a big word, a bomb, abomination. It's terrible. In fact, it's so bad that God goes, the reason I'm driving out, like way back when the Israelites took the promised land from the indigenous people, God goes, the reason I'm getting rid of those people and replacing them with you is because they were doing this sort of thing. So we're not talking about a small deal. And you might go, why? Because let's just own this. In our culture, this stuff is just basic entertainment, isn't it? It's just like commonplace. You know, you, just, you decide to date somebody, and you go, what's your sign? Oh, shoot. I mean, we, we just do. 
I think the reason that we do is because we have no gauge for the spiritual. For us, spirituality is just purely an intellectual exercise. It's about what you believe, not what might be real behind the scenes of this earth. But there is a spiritual realm taking place at all times around you and me, affecting you and me. I, I was amazed by this. You know, last, last Sunday I went trick-or-treating with my kids in downtown Lewis. And, and I'm not against my kids dressing up as superheroes and getting some free candy. Like, praise God. But what I am against is the sort of casual fraternizing with darkness. And it was just so odd to me because I'm walking downtown and like, again, like there are a lot of great things, but there are a lot of things that just sort of like took me off guard. Like how many people were dressing in all kinds of inappropriate ways. How many people are getting hammered like with, with, with booze right out in the open while kids are getting candy. And how many people, you know, like I was talking one day, oh yeah, last year, like my, my son met a fortune teller while we were out here doing this. And I was just like, man, there's such a thin line between that and pagan revelry. And we don't see any of it because to us it's just, we think just good clean, fun, but it's not clean. Like, you know what, like, why the Lord might have a promise as we're reading this in Deuteronomy? I'll give you three reasons. Uh, one, because when you begin to try and, like, consult mediums, psychics, fortune tellers, soothsayers, all that stuff, when you do that, you open yourself up to the demonic. You open yourself up to, like, oppression and affliction for gener all kinds of generations and generational curses. And by the way, what I'm not saying is that any person who has, has consulted a psychic is now demon-possessed, like the exorcist, because that's a sort of Hollywood indulgence of that. But the word, like, possessed is never in the Bible. The word is instead demonized. That's the word that we translate sometimes as, as possessed is demonized, like afflicted, tormented by the devil. Okay, and that, and, and that can become open season, all right? And so what, what I think one of the things the enemy has done is he's sort of, I mean, whether it be, again, The Exorcist, Conjuring, or all these sort of newer horror movies, what the devil does is he sensationalizes this idea of being afflicted by the devil so we don't see the everyday application of it. We think it's this thing like down the road where somebody's gonna be sort of you know, puking and head turning around 360, and if I don't have that, I'm okay. But, but no, that, that's not true. Like, like, when you mess with this stuff, you open yourself up to be attacked by the enemy. And that leads to the second reason why you don't want to do that. Um, because you're tapping into powers that are anything but godly or associated with God. You are like, when you say, okay, listen, I know God has said this, but I'm gonna. You are cohorting with the enemies of God. Like, to, to put this in perspective, like, it's, it's a spiritual treason. Like, if I were to say, okay, you know what, I just, I, I, I'm a, I love America, but I really feel like getting some weapons from North Korea. Could we not agree that's treason? Okay, well, God is king. God is the one who has said, consult here, not there. This is good, that is bad. And when you decide, okay, I'm going to go after this stuff, you are opening yourself up to be an enemy of God. It's an abomination. That's the word. And third, and that's just when it's, when it's, when it's authentic. That's when the, the enemy is actually in it. But let's just acknowledge some people out there are charlatans. Right? Yes, I mean, there are psychics out there. There, there are mediums who take advantage of people. They do things called cold readings where they just kind of read you to be able to, to figure out. Like, I mean, it's, 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 it's nuts, okay? So then the other reason why would God have a problem with it is because he doesn't want you to be victimized. So by consulting these people, you open yourself up to, to be taken advantage of and, and to give all kinds of money to glorify things that are not of God. And so here's Saul in our story. He knows what God has said, and yet he is now choosing to seek anyway. And you might go, why? Well, it's really, really simple. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's why. Because the desperate turn to counterfeit. They do. The desperate turn to counterfeit. You hear the stories of guys who are, who are on rafts at sea and, and turn to drinking salt water? Why? Because it's desperation. You know, I, I think, man, the, unfortunately, can I just say this? Listen, I, I love, I love the bride of Christ. I love what God is doing through his people, capital C Church. And I, I'm not one of those people who wants to be overly critical. I think it's easy to throw a stone at the body because like, if you, you just want to find something wrong and fault finding, and all that does is hinder all of us, okay? But can we just acknowledge that when it comes to living and walking in the power of God, that is not something that church is very open about or practicing here in the West? 
Like, like if we talk about, hey, you know what? I mean, for how many people? Okay, listen, if I were to say, yeah, God spoke to me, how many, like, American Christians would be weirded out by that? Right? And yet, and yet if I were to say, man, I felt tempted by the devil to do this, nobody would have a problem with that. So you mean to tell me you don't have a problem with Satan speaking individually, but God can't? I mean, what is that? And then that's the thing, the desperate turn to counterfeit. But here's the deal. You know why I'm not tempted to seek a psychic? Because I don't need one. I can talk to God. And he talks back to me. And if you're in Christ, you have the same promise for you. You know the reason I don't have to like look like, like, like you know, uh, cast lots or go tarot cards or all that nonsense? Because I have the actual power of the living God. I don't need the inferior thing. I mean, my goodness, maybe we've just forgotten this. And if you're taking us, write this down. Here's the thing that you have to understand about like our expectations and all this. To the church of Jesus, power is not a rarity. It's our birthright. To the church of Jesus Christ, those washed in the blood of Christ, okay? It's not a rare thing for somebody over in Africa or somebody in Christian history or a minister or, or a missionary. No, no, no. For you and me, if we are in Christ, we have the expectation that God will, not might, will speak to us, that God will, not might, act on our behalf and move in power. This is our expectation. Do you know where we got that expectation? Jesus Christ himself. This is what Jesus said about the life of a believer. I'll give you an example. In John 14, 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, meaning, guys, I am not lying. This is true. Take it to the bank. Whoever, who's a whoever? All of us who are in Christ, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. What, it, what was Jesus' ministry like classified by? Casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, speaking prophetically, announcing the kingdom of God. And Jesus goes, they'll do that stuff. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. In other words, I'm going to give believers the Holy Spirit and I'm going to keep moving. We can see another one. John 16, verse 13. I, I don't have the slide for it, but you just believe me, it's in there. You can read it later, okay? When the Spirit of truth comes, it says, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, talking about the Holy Spirit, but listen to this. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come meaning the Holy Spirit will tell you about stuff coming up. Give me an example. Not too long ago, I was, I was arriving at church on Sunday morning. And right as I'm about to get out of my car before we come in to get set up, Holy Spirit is just like, hey, there's, there's a person who's going to come up to you after the second service, and when they do, I want you to do this. Now, it's not every time, so if you're like, man, does God have a word for me? no, no. But it was enough, okay, and sure enough, second service comes, here comes this person, they've got some things that they believe that are false, and I already knew it was coming, and here's what we're gonna say to it. Okay, is it because I'm birthed the mighty man of God? No, it's because I'm birthed the Christian, because I'm birthed the child of God. That promise is to you as well. Listen, I'm not shocked when, when we have people that we pray for in our church who, who, are, who are in the hospital. Like we, 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 said one, like we had a daughter uh, of, of some of our members that, like, who are here right now okay, who, who was given a 5% chance of living. And guess what? She's out of the hospital. I'm not shocked at that because my God moves in power. I don't need the counterfeit. Am I preaching? Are we understanding each other? But Saul doesn't have that. It's quiet for him. And so our story continues in 1 Samuel 28, starting in verse 8. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments, because he didn't want anybody to know it's him, <laughs> and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. It's about to get spooky. And he said, divine for me a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said, well, surely you know what Saul has done, how he's cut off the mediums and necromancers from the land, yeah, back when Saul was following God. So she says, then why then are you, are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? Hey, you're trying, this, this is entrapment right here. All right, all right. What, what you're doing, like, don't you, sir, don't you know this is illegal? But look at verse 10. But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Can you see how he evokes the name of God in this blasphemy? 
He's consulting a medium and saying, as God lives, nothing's going to happen to you. Like, like he, 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 you know, we could go off on a whole other tangent about Christianizing sin, but, but the point remains, okay? Like, that's bad. That's really bad. So then verse 11, the woman said, well, who shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. So, okay, I, I, know, I know one guy who used to hear from God. Get him back over here. And the next part's kind of crazy. He says, okay. Okay, I'll do it. And this is her practice. She's going to consult the dead. But something happens next that she wasn't expecting. Like there's, I mean, listen, if she's a medium, this is kind of her routine. But something happens in, when she does it that absolutely takes her off guard and terrifies her. So look at verse 12. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out in a loud voice. In other words, she screamed in terror. So here, again, like, that might be commonplace for, for a lot of people, but this is kind of her business. You know, I don't expect exterminators to scream at cockroaches. <laughs> but here she's shocked. She's shocked. You know why? Because something's happened that she didn't intend. In fact, let me just say it like this. A power greater than hers has done something. Okay, so I want to be clear here, like, because sometimes if, if you know this story, people go like, all right, well, is it a demon, like, pretending to be Samuel? Like, what's going on here? The, the text is pretty clear that it's Samuel. Like, there is no, I mean, like, it, it's just, it, it refers to him as Samuel more than once. And so I would be inclined to believe that when the Bible says it's Samuel, it's Samuel. But here's, I think, the better idea. The reason she's so terrified is this. It's that God has intervened in this situation. Okay, so like, like here, here's all this demonic stuff that would normally be practiced, but this time God goes, no, 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 you want, you want Samuel? Let me raise him up for you. And he's allowed this witch to call on Samuel even though he normally wouldn't. And why? Here's why. Because his judgment on Saul has come. That's why. The reason that God allows, so if you're like, well, like, so would God allow it for me? If you want to get smote, I wouldn't play with that. He's brought, and this is just the crazy part of the story. I want Samuel. And so God goes, okay. And he brings up Samuel for one last word. So this woman screams, and now she looks at Saul, and she's dumbfounded because Samuel's telling her exactly who she's dealing with. And the woman said, it continues, the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said, oh, yeah, but don't be afraid. What do you see? What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth, which is a sort of ancient Near Eastern understanding of anything sort of supernatural. So it could be that Samuel is radiating with some sort of pre-resurrection visitation. It could just be simply this, that like um, it's a hugely supernatural thing happening that took her off guard. And so I see a God coming out of the earth. And verse 14, he said to her, what's his appearance? What's he look like? And she said, He's an old man coming up, and he's wrapped in a robe. And this wording is very specific. See, just a fun thing to know about Israelite history. It, it wasn't every person, but typically, you know, every now and then you would have a person uh, who's very select, and when they were buried in tombs, as Samuel probably would have been, they were wrapped in a robe. It was a symbol of honor. It was a symbol of respect. And so here's the idea going on. Samuel has just shown up in his grave clothes. And so that, and Saul, who was probably at the funeral, knows that. So look what it says. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. Good job, Sherlock. And he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. Verse 15. Then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am in great distress for the Philistines are warring against me and God has turned away from me and answers me no more either by prophets or dreams. Therefore, I've summoned you to tell me what to do, man. Verse 16, and Samuel said, why then do you, why do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm a prophet of God. God's against you here, bro. Verse 17, the Lord has done to you as he spoke by me. Remember that word that I gave, the Lord's torn the kingdom out from under you? 
For the Lord has torn the kingdom out from your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. So that we're clear, that's where it's going. Verse 18, why? Because you did not carry out the, or you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce anger or fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, verse 19, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines, and with that, it's quiet. Dang, son. Mm. And with that, Saul collapses. He's terrified. He's had a long day. He hasn't eaten anything. Nobody, like, he's just on the, uh, they, they finally rouse him. Come on, your majesty, you got to get out here. We'll, we'll kill a cow We'll like to give you some steak, just something. We got to get you moving. So they, they, they finally, after a lot of coaxing, get him off the ground, get him just to eat something. He's terrified. He knows what's going to happen. And he goes his merry way. He goes to the battle that he knows he's not going to win. Jump on down to chapter 31. Here's where our story concludes. Now, the Philistines, 1 Samuel 31, starting verse 1. The Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Verse 2, and the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan. And can I just, I want to just pause on that because... Everything that we know about Jonathan says he didn't deserve this. Um, I mean, Jonathan was the best friend of David. He was a man of integrity. He guarded David and everything. But, but there was a bigger picture going on. Um, and I want to just recognize something in Jonathan's character. That, like the last time we had any kind of dialogue between Jonathan and Saul in 1 Samuel it was a falling out, a rift between the two of them because Saul exploded on Jonathan and tried to kill him. Remember that? So what kind of character or integrity did Jonathan have to have to go with his father into battle anyway? I just think that's worth noting. All right, so look. So he struck down Jonathan, Abinadab, uh, Malkishua, the sons of Saul. Verse 3, the battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him. And he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. So you better kill me before they do something worse. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer, and all his men on the same day together. In one really bad afternoon, wiped out. And we could think about the application of this text. We could wonder, okay, what, what are some things we could take away from it? And there's a, there's a bunch of them. We talk about, hey, listen, when God speaks something, it will come to pass. That'd be accurate. We could talk about, hey, listen, take seriously the Lord, like walk in obedience towards him, disobedience, right to obey is better than sacrifice. Disobedience is a big deal, and we'd be right to do that. But as I was prepping with, like this week, I just felt like I had a really clear word for us as a church. So let me just give you this sort of earth-shattering, highly uh, harshed, very well-crafted statement that I think we need to know. Um, messing with the occult is bad. It is. Like messing with the occult is bad. When you do that, you open yourself up to demonic influence and destruction. Let me say it like this. Don't play with demons. What fellowship have light and darkness with each other? And Satan's really good at making all this commonplace. You go to Walmart right now and buy a Ouija board in the kids' section. You know how demonic that is? One of my best friends on the planet, before she started following Jesus, dabbled in witchcraft. She told me a story one time of her and her friend, as, as teenage girls at the friend's house, you know, 
using a Ouija board. And while they were trying to consult whatever it was they were trying to consult, they're in the friend's living room, and, and in the friend's living room, there's this big, heavy stone statue of, like, a head, and the head just fell over. Something that does not rock easily. And they look up, and they see this, what looks like just a three-dimensional shadow just go running across the house. They thought it was a guy, so they went running through the house with baseball bats trying to, they thought they had an intruder. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that, like, these things create curses on people. And these aren't the only ways that the enemy can attack, but just specifically, I feel like, led just to bring this out today. Listen, like, don't mess with Ouija boards or tarot cards or crystals or New Age or what's called Christian Buddhism. Is there such a thing, the idolatry of that? Some forms of yoga, chakras, seances, these things, they create demonic footholds, strongholds, bondings of power. They're bad. Idolatry. We go, oh, who does idolatry? You ever have a lucky rabbit's foot? What are you doing? You've got the foot of a dead animal that you're hoping will give you some kind of blessing. They used to sell them in the school store when I was in fourth grade. I had a blue one. And we laugh, but it's there, isn't it? Magic eight balls. You know what is it? It's just, it's just a little crystal inside. Yeah, and, and when you're talking about divination, it's just sticks being thrown. It's the power that you're consulting. And it's not God. Psychics, do I have to say that? You know how many people, oh, I went there and they told me this thing. I'll bet they did. Horoscopes, astrology. Palm reading, fortune telling, stay away from this stuff. If it's not God, you don't want to consult it. And you go, well, Bert, you're just being hyper, like, you know, you're being old school, you're being limited in your view. No, I know the book, and I know what the book says about these things. Like the book that you say you believe in. Look, I'll give you an example. There's a story in Acts chapter 16 where, where Paul um, is, is going along his way in Philippi. And look at this story, Acts 16. Verse 16 says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. In other words, this girl had a demon that allowed her to see the future. How does that work? I don't know. How much can the enemy see? I don't know. But clearly the scriptures say it does it. So you go to a fortune teller. Well, they told me what was going I'll bet they did. But you don't want it. And you know the crazy part is, listen, some of you, my, my brothers, my sisters, I'm telling you this not because you're a bad person, but because you didn't know. And others, maybe you did. Knowingly, unknowingly, you've opened footholds for the enemy, and you've been afflicted by it, and you didn't even know it. I mean, if we were to go through the scriptures and, and, and talk about, like, like the, the types of ways that the enemy had, attacks people, it's not just these hyper-sensationalized things. It can be stuff as simple as, like, having an emotional affliction where you're just constantly emotionally raw and you're up and down and you're emotionally unstable. You can, it can create, me, like, mental health issues we see in the Gospels or, or multiple personalities for sure. We can see, like, violent behavior come about as this. Hey, here's one that we see that, that isn't popular right now, cutting. Like we think, oh, so and so is just so depressed, and yet the gospels link a man who's possessed, living on the tombs, uh, with with demon activity, who cuts his body with stones. I mean, we we see like the, the effects of what the enemy does is in self destructive behavior, in physical infirmity. Here's one in a resistance to repentance and spiritual things. I was in a service and. Used to make me mad, but I can spot it now. I watched there. There was a, a loved one who came in, and this has happened more than once. It was just one time. I'd be like, "Oh, that guy's a jerk." But no, there's something to this. Where during the entire service, man, they're into. Oh, I like this music. This is good, all right. And then when the person got up to give the word and read from the scriptures and talk about the gospel, this person just glazed over. Arms crossed, head down. I'm gonna go to sleep now. And the speaker wasn't boring. What is, well, well, Jesus says that, like, like, one of the things that the enemy does in his parable of the sower, right? Like, the enemy's like a bird that seeds thrown on a path. The enemy comes down and takes it real quick before the person can receive it. So you find this sort of blockage to spiritual things and repentance. Hey, also, um, seizures. Am I saying all epilepsy is demonic? No. 
But we have to acknowledge that there are stories in the Gospels where Jesus cast a demon out of a boy who was having seizures. There are all kinds of ways, and they're merciless. It has nothing to do with how good a person you are. It's that the enemy doesn't care about you. It's that, I mean, he, he is somebody who likes to kill kids. Like, he does not care about how you're doing. And a lot of you, what's happened is, He's attacked you, and it's come through these footholds, these things that you messed with, and you didn't even realize that you had given him the foothold. But here's the good news. The good news is, if you seek the Lord and ask him to do something about it, that stuff doesn't have to stay. Look, that same story that we just read with the girl who's the fortune teller, Acts 16, look at the very next verse, 17. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation, which she's saying in a way that's turning people off. Verse 18, and she kept doing this for many days. Paul, he's got a gift of discernment. Set something off here. Paul, having becoming greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. There is a supremacy of Christ over the demonic, Period. This is not a thing where we've got a coax or it's a wrestling match. No, our God is greater, period, period. And the cool thing is his power and authority is given to every child of God. This is what Jesus says to to followers, not even the 12 apostles, just like like 70 followers that he sent out. He says this in Luke 10, verse 17. The 70 return uh, with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Verse 18, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 19, lock this in. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy, by the way, don't go running on snakes and and actual scorpions. These are terms for demons. And they're terms for demons because, because these things physically inflict pain on people, which things that demons do. I've given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over how much? All the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, hey, the good news isn't that demons have to obey you, it's that you love me and you're going to be with me. Satan is not the point of our religion. He's a footnote. We deal with him as we have to. The good news is Christ, that God has sent his son to die for you and me, and he rose from the dead to give us new life, to bring us into relationship with him. That's the thing that we get excited about. You know how much Christ has triumphed over the enemy? This is what Colossians 2, 14 and 15 say, like that Christ on the cross, by canceling the record of of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, meaning, okay, like all our list of sins, all the things that we could be accused of by the enemy, all our laundry list of shame and things that we've done wrong, Jesus has gotten rid of because he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. And look what that did, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In other words, Jesus has so thoroughly defeated the enemy, he's taken his weapons. Yeah. So here's the good news. If you want it gone, it can be right now. You know how I know that? Because I know what Jesus Christ came to do. 1 John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And look at this next sentence. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. So today, if you would say you've been afflicted, let's seek the Lord together and ask him to destroy it. And here's what this is going to entail. we're going to do something called renouncing and repenting. As a church, in just a second, we're gonna seek the Lord together. Every area of your life where you might go, man, I've opened myself up to the demonic, I've opened myself up to the occult, oppression, what have you. I want you to to recognize that thing, acknowledge it, and then say in the name of Jesus, I renounce it and I repent. I'm not going back to it, I'm not gonna do it anymore, okay? So I'm gonna just go through a list again. These aren't all the things, you might have to say some other ones, but today, let's begin to renounce and repent. And maybe on your own time, you need to just do that more. So I want you just to follow me. Every head bowed, every eye closed, here's what we're gonna do, okay? And you can just repeat this after me. In the name of Jesus Christ, and by the power of his blood, 
I renounce any foothold that I've given to the enemy. I renounce using Ouija boards. I renounce tarot cards. I renounce crystals. I renounce new age. I renounce chakras. I renounce seances. I renounce idolatry. I renounce psychics. I renounce horoscopes. I renounce astrology. I renounce palm reading. I renounce fortune telling. And I renounce anything that is associated with the demonic. In Jesus' name and by the power of his blood, I command any unclean spirit that I have let in or given a foothold to to leave in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It's done. It's done.